So what you're looking at right now are x-rays of the human spine. Now you may be asking yourself, I clicked on this video to learn more about sneaker history. Why am I being shown footage of x-rays and animations of human anatomy? Well, the human body is in part made up of a complex web of tendons, muscle fibers, and flesh. And so is your favorite sneaker from the 90s, the Nike Air Max 95. Okay, okay, so the shoe isn't actually made out of human flesh because that would be disgusting but it is in fact inspired by human anatomy. What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Brian and my brother Nacho and I make videos on sneaker history. He's actually sick right now, so I'm taking over hosting duties, but don't worry, he'll be back next week. But hey, if you love sneakers as much as I do, then you should strongly consider subscribing to our channel because we drop fire content about sneakers on the regular. With that out of the way, let's get into this video. In the early 1990s, Nike had just gained control over a large portion of the basketball shoe market. Basketball sneaker sales had become Nike's core driver of revenue, and their influence on the court was unprecedented. The NBA in the 90s was filled with talent and style like we'd never seen before. Arguably the best decade in basketball. At least that's what the old heads tell me. This was the lay of the land when Nike decided that it needed to refocus the attention of the public towards what got them there in the first place. What makes Nike, Nike? Performance running shoes. While Nike did have some influence in the running category, they were still considered the underdogs. This is when young Nike designer Sergio Lozano was brought into the picture. Lozano was an industrial designer who had only been at Nike for four years before being tasked with designing the Air Max 95. Nike wanted something brand new, something that would shock the running world. Famous sneaker designer Tinker Hatfield had just left the Air Max series to work on other assignments, and that's when Lozano was brought in. Here's what Sergio Lozano had to say about those times. So, one of the goals was to take our top level running product, which was the Air Max, and really reinvent it to make a statement and take it to a new level. Nike brought Sergio in to add a fresh perspective to the project. The original Air Max 1 featured layered panels of traditional mesh and suede which kept the shoe lightweight. Its most defining feature though was a window at the heel of the sole that showed Nike's air unit to the world for the first time. It was unlike anything anyone had seen at the time. When designing the Air Max 95, Lozano's end goal was to make a bold statement presenting an entirely new take on the original Air Max 90. It was a rainy day at Nike headquarters in Beaverton, Oregon, and Sergio Lozano was staring out into the world from his office window. Inspiration struck. I was looking across the lake out into the trees, and I began picturing the process of rain eroding the earth, and I thought it would be interesting if the perfect product was unearthed by erosion. Look at this sketch, it's amazing. It's dated April 3rd, 1994. You can see Lozano's creative process. Notice the upper, it has layers upon layers that are slowly revealed. Lozano imagined the walls of the Grand Canyon slowly eroding from water. Inspiration for Lozano did not stop there. As you know, human anatomy also served as a source of inspiration. If you look at the shoe from the rear where the heel support starts, you can clearly see Lozano taking cues from the human spine and its vertebrae discs. The upper portion of the sneaker around the laces was inspired by the way muscle fibers and tendons converge together inside our bodies. At first glance, you can't tell but the vertical textured accents on the upper are reminiscent of a ribcage. What do you think? Do you think it looks like a ribcage? Leave a comment below. The radical design that Sergio Lozano was pitching to Nike was quickly met with resistance though. Not everyone at Nike was immediately on board. In fact, when Sergio Lozano presented the sketches to them for the first time, Nike flat out told them there is no way we were going to produce that shoe. The shoe was controversial in every aspect. The original colorway of the Nike Air Max 95 featured a black to white gradient with volt green accents. The colors weren't for aesthetic purposes either. They were actually grounded in functionality. Here's a quote from Lozano himself, talking about the thought process behind choosing a black midsole on the shoe over a white one. We're in Portland, Oregon, and it rains a lot. And while we were observing runners using our sneakers that were predominantly white with white midsoles at the time, they got dirty real fast. So I was like, what if we use color to kind of disguise some of the dirt? It became the first ever Nike silhouette to use a black midsole. The volt green accents on the shoe were revolutionary for its time. It has since become a heritage defining Nike color that is synonymous with modern day Nike running shoes and apparel. Additionally, 
The Air Max 95 premiered a visible air unit at the forefront of the shoe, something that had never been done before. When the shoe released in 1995 for $140 retail, its risky design and departure from the previous Air Max made it an instant success. The shoe was loved by the running world for its design and functionality. The Air Max 95's unique colorway, awkward swoosh placement, and dual air-powered cushioning system also appealed to the youth. This was especially true throughout Europe and Australia. Where the sneaker garnered a following among criminals, Nike would never admit to this of course, but in the UK alone, the Nike Air Max's footprints had become commonly spotted at crime scenes. According to a forensic science report from the mid-2000s, the Air Max 95 was one of the top sneakers in a typical pattern frequency distribution for footwear marks from a UK police force. Whatever that means, the shoe had a huge following in America. Hip-hop artists Eminem and Drake have been spotted rocking them, and it's one of LeBron James' favorite sneakers off the court. The shoe's most famous moment was when West Coast rapper The Game shouted out the shoe in his 2005 hit with 50 Cent, Hater to Love It, where he rapped, I'll kill you if you try me for my Air Max 95s. Does anyone remember that line? I'd play it for you, but I don't want to get hit with a copyright strike. Since its release in 1995, the Air Max 95 has earned itself 25 years of cultural relevance. The silhouette has been released in over 150 colorways, a lot of them being notable collabs like the Atmos Animal Pack. Or how about the recent Carhartt Nike Air Max 95s, which I think are super dope. My brother Nacho would probably make fun of me because at some point I didn't really like Carhartt, and I do now, and he kind of calls me a bandwagoner, but you know, whatever, I don't care. But yo, listen, if you want to learn more about sneaker history, we've put together this playlist right here. It should be here or over here. I can't tell right now. Um, but you just click on that playlist and, you know, we got videos on like the history of Champion, the history of Fila, um, the history of, you know, the Air Max 97, which is a dope shoe designed by Christian Tresher. You should check that out. So go ahead and click on that and we'll see you over in the next videos.